Welcome back. In this video, we will introduce you to the notion of bias, its relevance for anthropological research, as well as other types of methodologies in qualitative research. Today, you will hear about examples of bias and how they can affect our research negatively. Let's get into it. A bias is essentially an assumption we make based on our own perception and conception of the world. In storytelling-based research, we make ourselves familiar with the subjective stories of individuals. Does that mean that our research is subjected or biased? Rather than pretending to be objective, a storytelling embraces subjectivity by putting meaning-making at the center. This aspect of a storytelling research needs acknowledgement at early stages of research. By acknowledging and discussing the biases of our research questions and inquiry, we can better prepare ourselves to work with unexpected dimensions of our research topics and places. In my own research, I work with islands. The island that is central to much of my work is Nine Island, a five square kilometer island off the coast of North Sulawesi in Indonesia. This island is inhabited by people of different religions, Islam and Christianity, and of different ethnic backgrounds, Bajo and Siao. If we follow a land-based perspective, or what we call terracentric approach, a five square kilometer island is quite small, isn't it? But the moment we zoom out, we see that islands, like Nine, are hubs where social environmental phenomena unfolds. Islands exist in the sea around them, also across the region, as islanders connect to family members, trade, teach, learn, etc. Do you remember the last time when I said that stories can help respect the relationship between meaning and practice, challenge biases, and ensure that the knowledge we produce in academic research remains coherent, ethical, and co-produced? Let's look at an example. My research aimed at exploring the ways in which islanders deal with climate change adaptation. My research design painted the story of a small island which lacks resources to deal with sea-related disasters and needs to develop a stronger infrastructures in collaboration with the capital, Manado. First bias. The sea poses a risk for islands. Second bias. Nine Island is small and isolated. Third bias. The closest capital city has the knowledge and sources to help. However, on a cloudy day on Nine Island, I was sitting on a bridge overlooking a distant extinct volcano called Manado Tua, meaning O Manado in Bahasa Indonesia. But Pahaji Kasming, an elder from the island with whom I was doing conversational interviewing, told me something that I will never forget. He said that I had brought my own questions in search of the answers of other people. He sustained that I was looking in the wrong direction. Look, he said, what do you see? You're looking for the wind, but you can't see it without water, without waves. I slowly realized that the sea was no other thing than Nine Island itself. And so were the boats, the seaweed fields spanning across waters, the fish who migrate were the island too. I had assumed islands were small, static, land-oriented places dependent on the knowledge of more urbanized places, hours away. As you can see, my biases turned into reflections. From biases to reflections, storytelling research helps you reposition your own research questions. Why is it important to challenge biases in and through our work? Some of the most common biases in the study of islands and maritime borderland environments include terracentric approaches, essentialism, representation claims, and extractive approaches to knowledge. Many anthropologists, literary scholars, poets, and educators have challenged the essentialism of most research about the sea, maritime and or island settings. Across Oceania, for example, scholars and activists like Epeli, Gosch, and Jet Neil Kitchener have centered their work on challenging biases about islands and the agency of islanders across the ocean. This has helped in the fight against socio-ecological injustice. In the 70s, as he was being questioned about nuclear testing in Oceania, the US Secretary of State, Henry Kissinger, stated, there are only 90,000 people out there. Who gives a damn? In today's clip, we have explored a difficult concept, the notion of bias, and we have reflected about how challenging them can help us ethically situate our research framework. 
from research questions to research methodology and methods. If you are still here, well done. Reflexivity in research is not an easy practice, but it can contribute to a more ethical world. In our next clip, we will zoom in to concrete examples of participant observation and how stories have helped this process. We will also discuss the journey of a researcher from confusion and hazy notions to a better understanding of the island's everyday life. Hope to see you there.